think that's that, what the general. I think it would be good to do that at this point now that the criminal case is is, is not open. But it's in the it's in the hands of NTSB. I don't know what they're doing as to come hey, up. Hey, the bureau just sent uh, traffic and a letter saying they wouldn't they couldn't identify uh, three uh, vessels that were in the vicinity for privacy reasons. Come on. Well, yeah. Well, uh, they don't know what. The, we all know what those were. And uh, in fact, I even okay. spoke I even spoke about those. In, Why were they publicly? Okay, what are they? They were naval vessels that were on classified maneuvers. It also shows something very peculiar was an aircraft was coming in and out of this military warning zone uh, with the high performance characteristics. This aircraft would come out of the warning zone, slow it from three, at 300 knots, slow down to 100 knots in 30 seconds, take a left turn, continue onward, take another U-turn, all increase into 200 knots, slowing down to 100 knots, coming back in. I did this three times. Wow, Flight 100 crashed. We have the Navy's own radar in its final sweep. 12 second sweep coming around towards flight 800. Well, where that Navy radar would sweep down towards the missile that Brumley saw, the Navy expunged that part of the database from the record before they would give it to us, and only in that narrow area. All of those things go very strongly towards saying that it was friendly fire. And then when you add the fact that if you objectively look at what Paul Angelides and the Angelides cluster witnesses saw and what Brumley saw, the distances to Flight 800 from where these people are looking are too great for it to have been a shoulder-fired missile. You bring it above shoulder-fired missile, it's almost impossible for a terrorist to have a delivery system of two missiles of substantial size within days of my becoming involved in the investigation and the possibility of friendly fire. I had a retired Air Force colonel, of all people, who worked in these areas before he retired. He said that if, in fact, it ended up being friendly fire, that you would have two missiles and not one. Because the way he put it was if the Navy, he was immediately blaming the Navy, being retired Air Force, if the Navy was stupid enough to have an exercise that close to commercial traffic, they would at least be smart enough to have a backstop missile. And I believe that that is the combination we're looking at. A backstop missile close into shore is fired to try to take out the errant first missile. And just one of those unfortunate things that happens, they, they met coming from opposite directions, they met at Flight 800. A commercial salvage vessel was available almost immediately to begin recovering debris after the crash of Flight 800. It was not used. Instead, two Navy salvage boats steamed for two days up from Norfolk. In the midst of the investigation, President Clinton issued an executive order lifting the government's normal whistleblower protections for those involved in the salvage operation. Newspaper articles indicate that the Navy has been reluctant to share information with the safety board. Well, Mr. Chairman, most of that uh, portion of the investigation has been done by the FBI rather than by the safety board. I'm not aware of, of anything that we have requested from the Navy that we have not received full cooperation from. They use national security to hide the location of naval units the night an airplane crashes? That's highly suspicious. Is it suspicious or simply stupid? Both. I'd volunteer to go back on active duty so I could court-martial the son of a bitch. If he ever pulled the trigger on a missile that big, that close to New York. The rumors that it was an accident uh, from a misguided missile from uh, a U.S. Navy ship or aircraft, I felt was impossible. From my experience, there's almost no way to keep anything as catastrophic as that secret in the military in, in a normal uh, ship or squadron organization. I am unfamiliar with any naval exercise per se. I do know that there was a P-3 patrolling the area, but they're not equipped to fire anything like 
like a stinger missile. And obviously, one clear factor that is of great concern is this letter, this threat that was faxed into an Arab-speaking newspaper, an Arab-language newspaper in both Washington, D.C. and in London. What can you tell us about what was said in that letter? Well, the letter was definitely a, a letter that threatened uh, physical harm to Americans in some place. It was not specific to Long Island. Government officials are saying they don't believe that it was predictive of this particular event. Uh, the warning was, we're going to, uh, some epithet about the president and uh, the silly president and the stupid American, you know, the standard stuff, but we're going to strike, we're going stri to, and we're going to strike at dawn, and you'll be surprised where and how. Well, that came in about six hours before the event, roughly. If you look at, now, of course, 8.30 at night is not dawn. It is dawn on the Saudi Arabia. Yes, and Mecca. Almost exactly dawn. I took the manual that I found on the Alpha Omega out of Massachusetts, one of the contract boats, took it into the Congress, waved it around, showed them the map, the, the dredging map. Right on the map it says uh, suspected uh, missile launch zone. Big red circle, 2.7 nautical miles. What they were trying to do was find the first stage of a stinger. Tactical readiness was a design requirement for stinger. The missile is packed in a disposable launch tube and is delivered as a certified round, requiring no field testing or direct support maintenance. The gunner inserts the identification friend or foe IFF connector and when the target has been visually acquired, aligns the target in the open sight. And when the missiles launch, it's a tube-mounted thing that sits on your shoulder. And when the gunner sits there and he has the, the he thinks it's in range, he starts the battery cooling and the, the, the seeker head uh, starts cooling down. And when he really thinks he's got the shot, he pulls the trigger. Now, if the missile was to go out at, at full power, it would kill the shooter. Okay, so what they designed is a little tiny can. It's called an injector can. It's a rocket fuel about, about the size of a Coke can. And it fits right on the back of the missile in the tube. It fires while the missile is still in the tube. The whole charge goes boom, just like a bazooka round, for those that understand how that works. So it shoots the missile out about 100 feet, and then the, then the main motor lights. Well, it kicks off that can. It drops in the water, and it sinks. That's physical evidence. Early in the investigation, the FBI had worked diligently to chase down evidence of a terrorist operation, searching boats known to have been off the Long Island coast mapping possible missile launch points with the assistance of eyewitness testimony. I know the agents that were out there on the boats. They were carrying live ordnance to show to these captains. And you know what? The first day they went aboard was right after the 96 election. It was uh, like November, early November. And they showed it to, the, to one of the first crews on these four boats. They said, oh, yeah, we've already found one of them and thrown it back over. The first missile, not the second missile, hit the left wing root, went into this number two main tank, and exploded. When it did that, it blew out all the internal supports along the fuselage here. It blew into the center wing tank, which was empty. The center wing tank, many seconds later, did explode in a huge explosion along with other fuel, way down at 7,500 feet. The initiating event was up at 13,820 feet exactly. An explanation in line with the conclusion of another investigation by the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. The center wing fuel tank did explode. We find that its explosion was as the result of the aircraft breakup. The initial event caused a structural failure in the area of flight station 854 to 860, lower left side of the aircraft. A high-pressure event breached the fuselage, and the fuselage unzipped due to the event. The explosion was a result of this event. A cigarette boat, a very high-speed, small boat, uh, could easily go from the spot where they launched the missile uh, at, at roughly 30 knots, get out to sea, be picked up by a mothership, sink it, and be gone. That's an example, just an example. The last airplane shot down that I'm aware of was in Africa. It was a 727. It ate two SA-7s. That only cost that rebel group that shot them down about 10 grand. 
if you cover up the truth of what happened to this airplane for whatever the political reason, you've done uh, world aviation a tremendous disservice because the threat is there. This was the 27th large aircraft hit by these missiles in the last 15 years. Not all of them went down. Following 16 months of unprecedented investigation, effort which extended from the shores of Long Island to several countries abroad, an investigation where hundreds of investigators conducted thousands of interviews, an investigation which was confronted with the obstacles of having the most critical pieces of evidence lying in 130 feet of water at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We must now report that no evidence has been found which would indicate that a criminal act was the cause of the tragedy of TWA Flight 800. So what this represents is if there was a missile that blew up outside the plane and pieces of the missile warhead shrapnel came through, uh, what it would look like in different thicknesses of this uh, material and at different velocities. So we could then take what we learned here, the scientists could, they could put this in their database and come here and compare it to the different holes and punctures that we see in the plane. There were 430 passenger seats and 21 crew seats had their seat covers removed and they were co-mingled in a dumpster. Uh, about two months into the investigation, I uh, went to the dumpster uh, with, uh, with the assistance, I have to say, of an FBI agent and uh, was tried to, uh, to sort out the materials in there. And we found, uh, in addition to the seat covers, uh, actual seats that had been missing that were mistakenly thrown in there. The most important part of the investigation turned out to be, I understand, over 150 witnesses who had, had seen from various angles uh, uh, something rising from the surface. Most of my Air Force career was in the intelligence business, uh, dealing with missile and space kinds of, uh, of issues. I have looked at aircraft that have been hit by missiles, uh, both air-to-air -air and ground-to-air missiles. I've interviewed pilots uh, who actually saw the missiles and other pilots who were in the area and not necessarily the target who also uh, gave descriptions of what the missile looked like. These were very consistent with the eyewitness descriptions that, uh, that I read uh, for people that, uh, that saw this incident. The eyewitness testimony collected by the FBI was not unsealed until 1999. Amongst the interviews, scores of diagrams documenting one or two objects rising from the surface and intercepting TWA-800. And the FBI took those accounts seriously, taking the unusual step of inviting a sister agency, the CIA, to produce a video explaining this eyewitness testimony. I'm just going to play the CIA, what the CIA told all of you and all of us on national TV, November 18th, 1997. The 21 eyewitnesses whose observations began earlier described what almost certainly was the aircraft in various stages of crippled flight after it exploded. Those who said they saw something ascend and culminate in an explosion probably saw the burning aircraft ascend and erupt into a fireball just after it reached its maximum altitude. From a distance of nine miles or more, this may have looked like a missile attacking an aircraft. But nothing in their statements leads CIA analysts to conclude that these eyewitnesses, in fact, saw a missile. The airliner should have been visible to any observer witnessing a missile approach it. So the eyewitnesses almost certainly saw only the burning aircraft without realizing it. To date, there is no evidence that anyone saw a missile shoot down TWA Flight 800. Initial speculation that a missile was involved was based totally on the statements of eyewitnesses who were seeking to assist the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the National Transportation Safety Board as these agencies probe into the possible causes of the tragedy. Without the assistance of these eyewitnesses, the accounting given here would not have been possible. I watched a press conference by the, from the FBI, and the press conference released a video uh, produced by the CIA, which is very dramatic, and it has an animation of the plane coming across the sky and losing its front section and climbing sharply. And throughout the video, they kept saying, not a missile. 
could not have been a missile. No way. Eyewitnesses didn't see a missile. And it seemed like more of a propaganda piece than an investigative effort. According to the FBI and CIA, the 747, crippled by the explosion in its center wing tank, lurched upward, rapidly rising 3,000 feet and creating the illusion of objects rising toward the aircraft. So the flare-like object he saw almost certainly was Flight 800 just after it exploded, not a missile.